Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to MDGO Traders. My name is Taryn, and this is the Guilds of Ravnica pre-release primer and the draft and sealed guide uh, for uh, Guilds of Ravnica. Have I already said that? <laughs> So as you guys know, we do this basically the week before or a couple days prior to the pre-release. We're going to jump into what you get at the pre-release, how to build your deck at the pre-release. And now, because of Guilds of Ravnica having seeded packs and particular guilds, whenever you pick your box, we'll go through that as well. So let's jump right into it, guys. First, we got to choose our guild. Boros, which is red, white. Demir, black, blue. Golgari, green, black. Celestia, white, green. And is it blue, red? So you'll have one of these five options here whenever you go to your local game store. By the way, if you don't have a local game store, make sure to go to the Wizards website and kind of see if there's a local game store near you where you can enjoy a pre-release. If not, I'm so sorry. Maybe next time. Um, but we have five guilds to choose from. Hopefully, your local game store will let you choose randomly whenever your name is picked. Um, spoiler alert, the best box to pick, and a lot of people are going to say this, is probably going to say, or is probably going to be Golgari, and the only reason is because of a card that's Assassin's Trophy. Now, this is not a reason to pick a box. If you're going to be playing sealed, like actual pre-release sealed, this is not a reason to pick a box, but it is a reason to pick a box if you're playing cards for standard, because you might, might, uh, get an Assassin's Trophy as your rare in the Golgari box. Now, keep in mind, uh, we'll kind of get through, you know, what everything comes with, but the pre-release inventory as far as what comes within the box itself is one seated pack, which is whatever, like, yeah, it's it's a rare, and it's a 15-card pack of the colors that are, you know, related to that guild. So, Demir, it's going to be 15 cards. Uh, one of them is going to be a rare uh, Demir card of some sort. Uh, and then five other regular booster packs, of course. Those can be more go Demir stuff. Those could also just be all Boro stuff. You don't really know because it's completely random. But the seated pack is kind of there to help you kind of build the deck archetype you want to build within Demir. It's uh, sometimes that it, that it happens like correctly where like, oh, you get into a nice Demir pack and then all five of your booster packs are really Demir focused as well. And that's awesome. And you can build a really powerful deck out of that. Sometimes though, that's not going to happen. And sometimes you're going to get a seated pack and be like, oh, I have a sweet rare. And then all the other packs in your booster packs is nothing but Boros or nothing but Selesnia. And they, it doesn't really interact with your seated pack. That can be one of the downsides to the seated pack here. Um, my advice to you, uh, pick whatever, you know, uh, box you want to go with. If you want to go with Boros, if you want to go with Demir, if you want to go with Celestia, definitely go for it. I'm probably going to go between Demir and, uh, is it for myself because I love both of those colors. And uh, we're going to talk about those archetypes, the sealed and draft archetypes later in this video. But for me, I'm probably going to go for Demir or is it because those are just two fun colors I really enjoy. And I'm an emo boy at heart with Demir. That's, that's, that's where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be playing some My Chemical Romance when I pick Demir. Um, but all of these are great to pick to go with. You're not really going to be like um, punished for going for one or the other. However, if your local game store does allow you to pre-order boxes, you might notice that Golgari might be pre-ordered because of that Assassin's Trophy card. <sighs> That's really sad and annoying um, because that shouldn't be a reason to get into uh, Golgari, as we'll talk about later in the sealed and draft packs, uh, because they're probably, to me, not even one of the more powerful of the sealed archetypes. But if you're not there to, you know, play the pre-release to actually enjoy it and you're there just for value then go gary might be it for you uh but so what you get you get one seated pack five booster packs one spin down die and one deck box and now they've included like this building a pre-release deck like pamphlet thing within it it talks about the uh mana curve <clears throat> the creatures spells all that kind of stuff how many lands you should have in a deck and all that which we'll talk about in this video as well uh, but you do get that and you get a nice piece of art as well and like you know a kind of guild explainer like what the Demir represents what the Selesnya represents what the is it represents all that kind of fun stuff um but the five regular packs and then the seated pack will be like you know the uh, nice date stamp stuff uh in a uh, plastic like clear uh pack and of course the spin down die with your golgari guild on top of it or not golgari guild your guild on top of it which is really nice uh so let's move on here real quick the deck mana curve so if you guys don't know, the pre-release is all about building 40 card decks. Um, so that means that you have a 40 card minimum. You can go up to 60 if you want to, uh, but you really don't have enough cards to really do that to make an effective deck. So 40 card decks, I always typically say between 16 and 17 lands for the 40 card deck. And that's like 24 to 23 non-land cards. So that's like your creatures, your spells, that kind of thing. A good rule of thumb is like maybe 15 to 16 creatures, depending on how your deck operates, what kind of archetype you're going for. Um, 
and then like whatever's left over between the 16 and 15 uh, you're gonna have you know between seven or eight different spells that kind of thing but you're gonna see here on the mana curve it's gonna be a nice curve right here so zero to two creatures would be one mana cost most of your creatures you want to be like maybe two or three mana cost and then it kind of gets lower again you don't want to fill your entire deck up with lots of five and six uh, drop bombs um, while those are great you know, you don't want to have every single card be that because that means you have no early game, so you can't really compete in the early game against like a Boros aggro deck, for instance. We'll talk about the deck, uh, or sealed archetypes in just a minute, but this is a good kind of uh, way to think about it. So, you know, you want to have zero to two creatures for one mana, four to six, then three to five, two to four, one to three, and zero to two for the six, seven, eighth mana. Unless you have lots of mana rocks, which there are in this uh, particular sealed uh, pool because of guilds around and capping lockets uh, for the uh, guilds, like individual guilds. Um, which might be coming into your seeded pack as well. I feel like though the seeded packs will probably come with a guild gate and probably come with a locket. However, they're completely random. I don't really know. Um, so they're seeded, but random, if that makes sense. <laughs> they're seeded for your guild, but you know, kind of random. I do assume though that there'll be a gate and a locket in there as well. Uh, but moving on from the mana curve, we'll talk about things to bring slash buy before you come to your local game store and while you're at your local game store. So first up, I have a burger right here down below me. Don't forget to eat before you come to a local uh, game store for a pre-release because you're going to be there for a while. Uh, most pre-releases last between four to five hours, depending on, you know, how many rounds are going to go, how, how long are they going to give you for deck building. Usually they're going to give you about uh, an hour. Some places give you half an hour and some places will be like, is everybody done? All right, let's start now. Like some places do that. You want to probably eat beforehand you're going to be there for quite a while. And for people who are going to the midnight pre-release, make sure to have some coffee with you or not with you, but make sure to drink some coffee before you go and make sure to have some caffeine in you so you don't fall asleep deck building or feel worn out by round four. That can definitely happen. Um, and, uh, you know, make sure to bring some stuff to write on or maybe just use your life counter that you have that you there is provided within the, um, the pre-release box there. Um, I like to bring a notebook for myself or a little like a little uh, like tablet for myself or something so I can keep track of my life total. But also because I like drawing and doodling in between rounds, if uh, everyone else is busy talking to each other, I'm like, why not just kind of chill for a second and uh, just doodle for a bit. But I really like it because it shows like, you know, I have 20 life here now, 18, now 17, now 15, now 12, now eight. Oh, I'm dead. You know, that kind of shows your delineation between turns. You can kind of keep up with it that way, like how your deck is operating against certain archetypes. Um, next up is going to bring is going to be dice. Dice is useful for uh, counters, plus one plus one counters, that kind of thing, onto uh, your cards if you are a particular guild or not. Some colors don't really need counters at all. Some do. Depends on what kind of guild you get into, what kind of guild you build. You won't really know that until after you've built your deck and after you've opened up all of the the, the packs in your uh, your pre-release box. So going for Celestia, you're probably going to have plus one plus one counters somewhere in your deck. Uh, but if you open a Celestia your box and you're actually in is it you may not need plus one plus one counters at all so just one of those things and of course the dice you can also get at your local game store um, I would recommend bringing your own but you know if you want to I'm sure they have a pack just like that where it's about like a 12 different little small dice for you for your plus one plus encounters and all that fun stuff and lastly the thing you need the most I would say uh, for your pre-release since this is a kind of a hype event is dragon shield not dragon shield specifically but card sleeves for your cards I know it's Kind of annoying to be like, you want sleeves for your cards that you just opened pack fresh. But I've been in many a pre-release where someone spilt a Coke if they allow drinks uh, on the tables and stuff like that at a local game store and all your cards got ruined and they were brand new and they even had the stamp on them that said that they were from the pre-release. So make sure to have some sleeves with you. Of course, your local game store will have sleeves at their local game store. So you can also buy like some cheap $5 sleeves. I'm sure they'll have some of those there. Um, and some pre-releases, even if you go to them, some of them even provide sleeves and you only need 40. So sometimes they have like, um, you know, split between like 40 and like uh, 40 and 60 as far as the sleeves. Just get some sleeves. Doesn't matter what kind of sleeves. I recommend Dragon Shield because they're the nicest for me. I really like the feel of them. I like how durable they are. And if I'm going to buy some sleeves, I'm usually going to use them later uh, for either a future pre-release or for deck building later down the road. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, four basic things here. Make sure to eat. That's always important. Of course, the local games store there, I'm sure will have like candy and snacks and that kind of stuff that, there as well. But sometimes during like deck building events and things like that, they won't let you buy drinks or, uh, you know, buy candies and all that. So I would be very worried about that. Make sure to ask your local game store if it's okay to bring food, if they're allowing that. Sometimes they don't want you to do that. So it's all about your own local game store whenever you go. So I always just make sure to have like a sandwich or something before I show up. So that way I'm, I'm, I'm satiated so I can continue to build without really worrying about, uh, you know, me dying of hunger or thirst. 
Um, yeah, again, bring the notebook, bring some dice, and of course, bring some card sleeves. Uh, so we're going to get into the draft and sealed archetypes. But first, I wanted to kind of talk about, like, before we get into the, all of the draft and sealed archetypes and stuff, when you're at a pre-release, make sure to be nice to everybody. Make sure to be kind, be sweet. Um, if there's some younger kids there, which I'm sure there will be because it's a pre-release, because it's like a hype event, it's a new event, new set coming out, um, just make sure to be patient with everybody. Pre-releases are, above all, the most casual of events for Magic the Gathering. So if you're going to go to a pre-release, make sure to keep it casual. Just keep it, you know, keep it like calm, keep it collected. And most of the time, local game stores will have multiple events. So if the first event you went to wasn't great, you might be able to go to another one and it'd be a bit better. It all depends on who's showing up at that particular event. Um, but yeah, again, if there's like a bunch of like seven and eight year olds showing up really wanting to try and get into magic, let them try and help them out, man. One time, or not one time, the last, uh, I think Dominaria pre-release, I was playing against an 11 year old girl and, um, she was having trouble, like understanding the, like the line of play for some of her cards. And I was like, you know what, how about we just have our cards in front of each other? And then I just kind of teach you how to play that way. How does that work? And she's like, yeah, that's fine. And I was like, great. This way you can help. I can help you. And, uh, you know, you can maybe win or maybe I can win depending on what we have in our hand, that kind of thing. So if I, but if I lose, I'm not going to be a sore loser about it. I'm going to be like, awesome, good game. And I'm going to go to the next game because it's all about kind of interacting with these new cards, understanding the archetypes and just having fun. That's all the pre-releases are all about. It's about having fun, meeting friends and uh, getting sweet new cards like Assassin's Trophy. <laughs> so let's get into the um, draft and sealed archetype guys. Um, so Guilds of Ravnica has five guilds and that means five archetypes to play for draft and sealed. So most of the time you have like maybe eight or 10 different archetypes. Uh, for draft and sealed environments. That's totally kind of thrown out the window most of the time, or for this particular uh, format for Guilds of Ravnica, because there's five different guilds for this particular set. Um, so all of the cards are kind of revolving around five different guilds. We have Demir Control, Boros Aggro, Izzet Spells, and then we also have Golgari Death or Golgari Undergrowth, and Selesnya Midrange. Uh, and I'm showing like some rares here, because these rares might be the rare you get into your pack. And this is one of the uh, best things you kind of see as far as like what kind of archetype you want to go into. These are, I feel like, the best examples of the archetype. So Thief of Sanity is a three mana 2-2 two -two Spectre rare flyer. Uh, the when it deals combat damage to a player, look at the top three cards of that player's library, exile one of them face down and put the rest into their graveyard. For as long as that card remains exiled, you may look at it, you may cast it, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast that spell. So it's really good because it's a three mana 2-2 two -two flyer, which is amazing to be able to attack in on turn four. It's probably gonna get in for at least one or two hits, which is great. It's milling your opponent for six cards if it hit for tw for, two, for hit two times and it's you know exiling two cards if it hit for two times as well so and those are cards you can use against your opponent which is really good so thief of sanity all about controlling your opponent all about that sweet in the air damage uh, Tajik Legion's Edge is a 3 mana 3 2 legendary creature human soldier. It's also a rare with haste, mentor, and mentor is a new mechanic. We talked about that in the set review. Uh, whenever this creature attacks, put a plus one plus one counter on target attacking creature with lesser power. So, this is all about playing lots of small, low to the ground creatures really quickly and attacking in for face. Just trying to win to win the game as quickly as humanly possible. That's what aggro is all about, and Legion's Edge is all about that. You can also prevent all non-combat damage that would be dealt to other creatures you control, and Tajik can also pay two and give himself first strike until end of turn, and that's for your turn as well as your opponent's turn if you want to pay the mana both times. So Legion's Edge, very powerful. And if Mizzet, of course, uh, normally a mythic, but now it's going to be an, a rare in this particular Guilds of Ravnica set. Uh, Niv Mizzic Perun is a 6 mana 5-5 five, five, legendary creature dragon wizard rare. It can't be countered as flying, and whenever you draw a card, it deals 1 damage to any target. So that's a creature, that's a planeswalker, that's an opponent's face. And whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery spell, you draw a card. Again, very, very powerful. All about you wanting to play spells, draw cards, do stuff. It's also a 5-5 five, five flyer, so it can win the game in 4 hits if your opponent is at 20. Um, so if they don't have an answer for it, they may just die to it. Um, but again, you, you want to be playing out all your instant and sorcery spells as quickly as possible. So you're drawing cards, you're dealing damage, and you're doing stuff. That's all is it's all about is doing stuff. Um, other guilds here are Golgari Death or Golgari Undergrowth. This is a Charnel Kroll, uh, Troll, not Kroll, Troll, a three mana four for Troll. It's a rare. It also has Trample. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile a target or a creature card from your graveyard. If you do, pull a plus one plus one counter on the Troll, otherwise sacrifice it. You can pay to discard a creature card and put a plus one plus one counter on the Troll. So 
This is all about having lots of cards in your graveyard, having lots of cards in your hand, throwing things to your graveyard to power up the troll so the troll can get in for damage turn over turn until you run out of gas and it kills itself, um, which is fine uh, because it's very, very powerful because it has trample. So it's gonna get over basically anything your opponent has um, by turn four attacking in. Very powerful card for three mana. Um, so this is kind of like the premier Golgari card. There's so many good Golgari cards in the set as well. We'll talk about those uh, later in this video, but the troll I just really like because it's like, it's like showing off like, you know, the graveyard is all about, you know, stuff that you can feed the troll, you know, all that kind of stuff. Don't feed the troll, but this time you do want to feed the troll. <laughs> so Lesnia Midrange is all about mid-range, kind of mid-game of value town. So Knight of Autumn is kind of a good example here. It's a three mana, two one, knight, a uh, dried knight rare. When it is the battlefield, we get to choose one. It's three different options here to uh, put two plus one plus one counters on the Knight of Autumn or destroy target artifact or enchantment, or we gain four lives. So in the early game, we probably want this to be a 4-3. In the mid to late game, we might want to destroy an artifact or an enchantment. And in the late game, where we're kind of almost dead, we may want to gain some life. So this is really good uh, incremental advantages uh, throughout the entire uh, like expanse of the match. So very good card for that. Um, I really do love Knight of Autumn here for a good example of what Celestia Midrange is all about. Obviously, they have Convoke as well, which is a new mechanic, or not a new mechanic, a returning mechanic. Um, so it's very good for that as well. But Knight of Autumn, just a fantastic card by itself. Um, so let's jump into some of the archetypes. First up, we've got Demir Control. Demir is all about incremental gains and slowly winning one, with either one bomb or small tiny pings over and over again. So it's all about kind of making your opponent, you know, stopping your opponent, saying no to your opponent, and then uh, being like, I'm gonna play this one one, I'm gonna play this two two, I'm gonna play this five five, and then hit you four times and you're dead or something like that. So some good uh, commons for the Demir control list. One of my favorites is Artful Takedown, a four mana instant. Choose one or both, tap target creature, or target creature gets negative two and negative four until end of turn. Both of these things are amazing. Really does put your opponent down a turn, basically if they're attacking in, if they're being aggressive, or it kills one of your opponent's creatures while tapping down another creature, making sure you can get in for some damage as well. Deadly Visit, just a great removal spell for us. A five mana sorcery, destroy target creature with the new mechanic, Surveil for two. Move the top two cards of your library, then put any number of them into your graveyard and the rest on the top of your library in a random order, or in, in any order, not random order, in, in any order. Um, so Surveil's very, very good at being able to line up your next plays, very good at being able to kind of cheat draws into play that kind of thing um, get out of like uh, situations where you're drawing into too much land or too many creatures like you need land like if you keep drawing into creatures just surveil get that stuff off the top of your deck and maybe draw into some more land surveil is very very good at being able to line up your next play just an awesome card overall and of course deadly visit is just a good removal spell demir informant is a three mana one four human rogue so a good early blocker but it also has a surveil for two when it enters the battlefield as well so Again, I just can't stress how good Surveil is. It's one of the most powerful mechanics within Guilds of Ravnica. Um, very, very good at being able to line up your next play. And it's a 1-4, so it's gonna block most stuff by like turn five or six most of the time. Notion Rain is another good common for us. A three mana sorcery, Surveil two once again, then draw two cards and it deals two damage to you. This is at sorcery speed, but at the same time, you're still drawing two cards and looking two cards deep. So it's almost like a glimmer of genius uh, back from the Kaladesh block. Very good card. In the, the two cards that you surveil, you may not even want those. Just throw them to the graveyard and draw two cards off the top fresh. And I think that's amazing. And the two damage on top of you from Notion Rain, eh, that's perfectly fine. Nobody really cares about that. <laughs> Next up, we've got um, City Watch Sphinx. This is one of the uh, top end bombs for you for your, your uh, Demir list. A six mana 5 4 flyer. When it dies, you get to surveil for two. So even when the stuff that's Demir does die and pass away, uh, Sphinx still gives you that sweet surveil uh, options. Sinister Sabotage is one of the best uh, counter spells within uh, the uh, Guilds of Ravnica set here for Demir. Three mana instant counter target spell and Surveil for one. So we get to say no to our opponent while also looking at the top of our deck being like, do we want this? Mm, sure. You know, that kind of thing. So it's really good uh, like interaction between you for Demir. Demir Spybug, a two mana one one insect flyer with menace and uh, all those Surveil things. But this kind of pays us off here. Whenever we Surveil, put a plus one plus one counter on Demir Spybug, which is amazing. Uh, keep in mind though, if it says Surveil 2, that's only one Surveil trigger for the spy bug, so it still only gets one plus one plus one counter. So if it's Surveil 2, Surveil 1, Surveil 3, just the, the Surveil trigger itself, not the number beside it, is what gives the counter. Um, so Nightfell Sprite here, a two mana one two human, uh, f fairy rogue, not human rogue, fairy rogue flyer. Whenever it attacks, we get the Surveil for one. So the Sprite and the spy bug together, 
fantastic combo, a great way for us to get in some early points of damage with the Sprite, as well as just making our Spy Bug really powerful in the mid to late game. Keep in mind the Spy Bug also has Menace, so it has to be blocked by two or more creatures, which is uh, kind of hard to do in the air sometimes against uh, Flyers. Um, so that's the best I would say as far as uncommons. There are of course other cards within the set. Those are just kind of the ones I wanted to pick out for control for the Demir. Um, a lot of this is almost kind of aggro based, uh, but Demir has a lot of stuff within the set itself that kind of helps you kind of set up your next play, get good, good value on the battlefield, good removal, and then just kind of attack your opponent for small incremental damage in the air or a big flying bomb like the Sphinx there. Next up, we have Boros Aggro. This is all about, you know, turning your uh, your creatures sideways and attacking it as quickly as possible. It's about being fast. A low-to-the-ground strategy curve is most important here, as well as keeping those creatures sideways, basically. Wojek Bodyguard is a great common for us. A 3-mana three 3-3 three, three with Mentor. Mentor is a new mechanic from Boros here. Whenever this creature attacks, put a plus-one, plus-one counter on target attacking creature with lesser power. So this means that if you're attacking with the Ornery Goblin here, a 2-1, and the Bodyguard, the 3-3, three, three, the Ornery go uh, Goblin becomes a 3-2 thanks to Mentor here, which is very good in the Boros Aggro list because you want to be attacking out as often as possible. However, one of the downsides here to the Bodyguard is that it is a 3-mana three 3-3, three, three, which is great, and it has Mentor, which is amazing, but it can't attack or block alone. So that's not really a downside for us because we're all about mentoring and making sure our creatures go out as quickly as possible. So Sworn Companions is, a, is here and it's kind of a Selesnian card, but I wanted to put it into the Boros Aggro side as well. It's going to be in the Selesnia side as well too, but it's a three mana source where you create two 1-1 one, one white soldier creature tokens with lifelink. Now the lifelink really isn't that important to us, but a three mana spell that creates two 1-1s one is fantastic because it's, it pairs really well with the mentor mechanics here within the Boros guild. So I really like Sworn Companions here as a great Great common and just a fantastic enabler for us to get those mentor triggers off. Cosmotronic Wave is a four mana sorcery, deals one damage to each creature your opponent's controls, and creatures your opponent's control can't block this turn. This is a card that's going to win you the game, basically, or board wipe your opponent, whichever way it kind of goes. Um, a great way for you to get all of your creatures kind of going in. Again, uh, Boros Aggro wants to be attacking in, winning by turn four or five if possible, and a uh, Cosmotronic Wave is going to do that. Ornery Goblin here is another great attacker for us, a 2 mana 2-1 Goblin Warrior. Whenever uh, the block Goblin gets blocked or becomes blocked uh, by a creature, it deals 1 damage to that creature, which is very good uh, because it basically means it can trade really nicely with 1-1s without really dying, which is kind of great here. Um, really love the Goblin's ability here and just being super aggressive as a great common for Boros. Next up for these uh, uncommons here, we've got the Goblin Banneret. This is a 1 mana 1-1 one, one with Mentor, again a great mechanic here, but we can also pump it for 2, giving it plus plus two plus zero into a turn. So again, it's a one, one coming in on turn one and attacking in on turn two, but it's not really gonna be pumping anything until probably turn three when you have the mana to have the pump on top of it with something else. Um, I just like it in here as an uncommon for Boros because it's gonna be turning sideways as soon as possible. And of course, pumping itself and giving mentor triggers as well. Once you get a lot of mana on the field too. Sun Home Stalwart is another good mentor card for us. A two mana two, two first striker with mentor. Again, the first strike is very good for us because it's gonna be able to trade really nicely with, with a bunch of stuff that's like three twos on your opponent's side of the field that they spent three mana for. You just spent two mana for a two two first striker and you trade really nicely with them. Hazza Marshall is another good Boros card for us. A one white mana, one one human soldier uncommon. Whenever it, whenever uh, the Marshall and at least two other creatures attack, you get to create a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token with lifelink. Again, this is similar to the Selesnya guild, but it's also very good for Boros because it's creating a wide board state for those mentor triggers to continually go off, making those 1-1s one, into 2-2s two, the following turn. That's just the bread and butter of what Boros Aggro wants to be doing in this pre-release. And the last uncommon here is a great removal spell. It's got Convoke on it, but again, it's just a great card overall for the Boros color. A four mana enchantment with Convoke. Whenever it enters the battlefield, Exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls until Conclave Tribunal leaves the battlefield. Um, so Convoke again, if you guys don't know, is uh, your creatures can help cast this spell. Each creature you tap while casting the spell uh, pays for one colorless or one mana that creature of that creature's color. So this could be a free removal spell if you wanted it to be. Uh, but I do think it's a very good card regardless. Uh, for Boros, because you have a lot of creatures on the battlefield, you're probably going to be in the 16 to 17 creature range in Boros Aggro. And Tribunal is going to be a free removal spell, basically against a board state uh, with large creatures like Golgari uh, or Selesnia. So moving on here, we have Is It Spells? So moving on from uh, Boros to Is It, a little bit of a different format here for uh, Is It. 
Uh, this is all about casting spells. It's here for you. And while it's a little inconsistent, if you get all the pieces, it could be the best guild in limited. And that's kind of true here. If you have all the pieces of the is it deck um, in limited, it just kind of is bonkers and goes insane. <laughs> First up we have with our commons, we have radical idea here. It's human instant draw card with jumpstart. It's a new mechanic for guilds of Ravnica for is it. Um, you may cast this card from your graveyard by discarding a card in addition to paying its other costs, then exile this card. So two mana draw a card on your opponent's instep, discard a card, draw another card for two more mana. Very, very powerful. Kind of helping you cycle, cycle through stuff as well as having stuff in the graveyard for other spells down the road. Maximize Altitude is another jumpstart card with a one blue mana sorcery. Target creature gets plus one, plus one and gains flying until end of turn. This could be target creature gets plus two, plus two and gains double flying? Not double flying, just regular flying. <laughs> but still very, very good at being able to get over uh, a lot of those Boros aggro cards uh, and a lot of the Selesnya stuff uh, to get in some extra damage on top of it. It's also a sorcery speed, uh, you know, uh, trigger as well, which is very good too. Sonic Assault is a three minute instant tap target creature. Sonic Assault deals two damage to that creature's controller with jumpstart as well. Again, it's really good because it's an instant speed spell. So helps when your opponent's trying to tap out against you. You just tap one of their creatures and ping them for two in the face. Very good. You can actually do it twice if you have six mana and a card in hand. Very good for you. Um, and Fire Urchin here is kind of the payoff for all of these great instant sorcery cards. A two mana one three elemental with trample. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, Fire Urchin gets plus one plus zero until end of turn. So turning this into a you know a possible three three uh, or three four uh, with maximized altitude is very very good. It also has trample too. So even if it's not going on the ground, it's still being able to uh, get by with some damage to your opponent uh, because of that trample clause. And um, radical idea, sonic assault, they all kind of go towards the fire urchin here and being able to make this a huge creature attacking it with trample damage. Um, so let's get into the uncommons here. Chemister's Insight is a four mana instant draw two cards with jumpstart. And again, jumpstart just discarding a card. So you draw two cards on your opponent's instep, and then uh, you can do this on your opponent's instep again if you want to with jumpstart. Very nice. Um, if you have the mana for it, that's eight mana. So you probably won't be able to do that. But doing it on your, your turn as well is also very good. Murmuring Mystic here kind of makes all of these instants and sorcery spells really worth it. It's a four mana, one five wizard. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, create a one one blue wizard illusion creature token with a Flying. So, woo, if opponent does not have a removal spell for this mystic, it just kind of takes over the game, making lots of 1-1 flyers. Uh, very hard to deal with with your opponent and very difficult to remove because of the five toughness. They need a straight removal spell for this because we're probably not going to block with this at all. Uh, Lava Coil here is a great removal spell for us for is it the two mana sorcery uh, uncommon. Deals four damage to target creature. If that creature would die this turn, exile it instead. Very good Golgari hate because Golgari is all about having creatures in the graveyard. If we Lava Coil something, it's not going to return to uh, the graveyard. It's going to get exiled. So that means that they can't use it for their undergrowth ability. And Cackling Drake, or Crackling Drake, not Cackling, Crackling Drake is a four mana star four Drake. This is probably the top end uncommon card I really like here. Its power is equal to the total number of instant sorcery cards you own in exile and in your graveyard. That, so that, that's really good for us because we have lots of cards with Jumpstart, which means they are will, they will be exiled and out of the graveyard, but the Drake doesn't really care about that. It's still going to be counting those cards as well, which is very good. Makes us kind of keep pushing forward uh, on our, uh, you know, instant and sorcery spells. Um, and also when the Drake enters the battlefield, we get to draw a card. So again, the Drake is doing lots of good stuff. Even if it's a 2-4 on turn 4 uh, coming in, um, it still gives you card advantage as well, which is very good. Kind of making sure you get into more spells as the match progresses. Is it is all about getting a lot of spell advantage, making some flyers, and then getting in some damage that way. There's also some good burn spells as well with split cards and stuff like that, but I really wanted to talk about just the, the main kind of drivers of what is it kind of does. Um, I do think it's powerful. However, I do think that it is one of the more difficult kind of guilds to build because of how specific some of these cards have to be. So let's move on to the next guild here. We've got Celestia mid-range. Celestia is the strongest, I feel, out of the five guilds on the surface. Mostly the most powerful commons and go big spells that you can make cheaper. It should say big there in the uh, text, but it does not. That's my fault there. <laughs> so Sworn Companions is a card we just talked about earlier uh, with the Boros Guild, so I'm not going to repeat that, but very good here. Being able to create lots of Convoke triggers. Pax Favor is one of the first Convoke cards we have here a three mana instant with convoke target creature gets plus three plus three into end of turn not only is this a great uh, pump spell for you but it can basically be a free pump spell for you which is the best 
Um, Siege Worm is here for us as a seven or yeah, seven mana five five with Convoke and Trample. This is probably the premier uh, common card for you for your Convoke strategy for Selesnia. Uh, making this a four mana five five with Trample is always useful and always uh, spicy. Um, that's only tapping down, you know, uh, three creatures, which is not bad and not like uncommon to see for the Siege Worm. Um, very powerful as a 5-5, five, five. and of course Trample on top of it just makes it really nice. Uh, Rosemane Centaur is a 5-mana 4-4 four, four Convoker uh, with uh, Vigilance. Again, very, very good, and you can get this out for 3-mana instead of 5 very easily. As, as long as you're playing out your cards and your creatures often enough and your opponent isn't removing them, uh, then you're going to be able to have Convoke triggers to make sure that these creatures are way cheaper than they should be. Moving up to Uncommons here, we have Conclave Cavalier, a 4-mana four 4-4 four, four Centaur Knight with Vigilance, and when it dies, create 2-2-2 two, two, two green and white Elf Knight creature tokens with Vigilance. So it's a 4-4 four, four that still creates 4 more power once it dies. That's insane. Um, really the only thing that's going to uh, deal with this card well is either Exile Hate in white or or Lava Coil in red. And besides that, if it's gonna die the traditional way as in being blocked or um, just, you know, destroy target creature spell, um, it's gonna create two more, uh, two creatures on the battlefield, which gives you lots of uh, Convoke abilities as well. So very good card here, really like it uh, for Celestia because it's a card that's a big creature already, but it even go it goes wider once it does trade with something. Sprouting Renewal here is a great card for us, a three mana sorcery with Convoke. We get to choose one here, which is uh, create a two, two uh, green and white elf knight creature token with Vigilance or we get to destroy target artifact or enchantment. This is a great card because it gives us the ability to have kind of like, you know, middle of the game removal for artifacts and enchantments in your main board in a draft in, uh, in limited. Uh, just a great card overall, really good in the Selesnia guild, and I do like it because, it, you know, it can, can create a 2-2 for free or destroy artifact or enchantment for free. So overall, an amazing card. Mighty the Masses is here as a one mana instant uncommon. Target creature gets plus one plus one until end of turn for each creature you control. This is an instant spell, so it's gonna be good offensively and defensively. Um, and it's really good in the Celestia guild because of course you're going super wide in the Celestia guild, so why not use Mighty the Masses as a great way to get in for five extra points of damage at instant speed. Just amazing, very powerful. And our top end Convoke Bomb here for us is a nine mana Abortem Elemental, a seven five Convoke creature with Hexproof. Of course, guys, if you don't know what Hexproof is, it is this creature can't be the target of spells or abilities your opponent's control. That's right. That means your opponent's going to have to hardcore, you know, block this with a real creature and pump that creature um, if they want to kill the elemental here. Very powerful card. Uh, very hard to deal with once it hits the battlefield because they can't remove it with any kind of like regular spell or sorcery or whatever. Um, and convoking it actually isn't bad either because it's only nine mana. Getting it down to six mana as a seven five with uh, Hexproof is probably no big deal at all. And that's gonna wrap it up for the Selesnya here, so let's get into the next skill. This is Golgari Death or Golgari Undergrowth. Golgari is all about throwing stuff into your yard, then taking advantage of it by powering up your fresh spells. Uh, so very good cards here for the uh, common slot. We have Undercity Uprising, a four mana sorcery. Creatures you control gain death touch on end of turn, and then target creature you control fights target creature you don't control. So a removal spell on top of giving your entire board death touch. That's amazing, a great way to end a match or a great way to kind of uh, create a situation where they have to block creatures. Let's say they have five uh, life left. We have f uh, five power on the board attacking in. They have to block something if they don't want to die. And since all of our creatures have death touch, they're probably losing their creatures at the same time too. So very good for us, very good card to go forward with. A uh, Moonmark Painter here is a four mana two, three human shaman with undergrowth. Undergrowth is the new mechanic here for the Gilgari clan. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, target creature gains menace and gets plus X plus zero on twin return where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. Again, undergrowth is just really good at being able to close out a match because plus X plus zero is fantastic, but giving menace on top of that even better. Uh, this is a great card for you if you wanna close out a match, but also just a great blocker for you and a great way to introduce uh, bad blocks for your opponent. Uh, Spinal Centipede here is for us because we have to have creatures go to the graveyard, but also if, if they're going to the graveyard, they might as well pump our, our, our board, right? A three mana three two insect, whenever it dies, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. So a three mana three two is pretty pretty good for a uh, uh, draft and sealed, but when it dies, it actually pumps up something on our side of the field as well. So it's just an overall great card. It's, it's helping to pump up undergrowth. It's helping to pump up our board state. It's like the perfect Golgari card for your Golgari guild deck. Then a Vigor Spore Worm here is a six mana six four worm with undergrowth. When it enters a battlefield, target creature gains vigilance and gets plus X plus X onto end of turn where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard and the worm can't be blocked by more than one creature. For six mana at common, this is one of the best bombs uh, for you 
uh, for draft and for sealed. Uh, and if you get into this for your pre-release guild uh, for Golgari, then it's just gravy all around. Uh, being able to pump something else up whenever it enters the battlefield is great because it makes you have the ability to have a great attacker when the worm comes in. And then next turn, you'll also have a 6-4 attacking in that can only be blocked by one creature at a time, which is just amazing. So a great common for us for Golgari. Moving up here to our uncommons, we've got Necrotic Wound, one of the best removals for Golgari, a black uh, mana instant uncommon with undergrowth. Target creature gets negative X, negative X onto the end, end of turn, or X is a number of creature cards in your graveyard. If that creature would die this turn, exile it instead. So this is one of the cards where if you have a lot of stuff in your graveyard, lots of creatures in your graveyard, this is a great way to get rid of another large creature on your opponent's side and also exile it, meaning if they can get it back somehow, some way, they won't be able to because it's completely exiled. Undercity uh, Necrolisk is a great way for us to uh, sacrifice creatures, a 4 mana 3-3 three, three uncommon. The zombie Lizard, we can pay one, sacrifice another creature, and put a plus one plus one counter on the Undercity Necrolisk. It gains Menace to end of turn, activates the ability only anytime you can cast a Sorcery. This is a great creature for us because it's going to have pseudo evasion, it's going to be larger every single time it attacks in with the evasion, um, and it's going to just you know continue to feed our yard with creatures that we need for undergrowth abilities in the future. So Necrolisk could be one of the best creatures for you for your Golgari deck. A uh, Crawl Harpooner is another great card for us. Kind of a removal spell, honestly. A uh, two mana three two insect warrior with reach undergrowth. Uh, whenever it enters a battlefield, choose up to one target creature with flying you don't control. The Harpooner gets plus X plus zero until end of turn, where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. Then you may have the Harpooner fight that creature. So. Let's say Aurelia in Boros is giving you a trouble. That is a, I believe, a 2-5 flyer. Um, play this, make it a, you know, a 6-4 or a 6-2 uh, that has reach and then it fights. I think that's very good. Uh, Harpooner is a great card for just two mana. It's also a 3-2 for two mana and it's just also has reach. It's just, it's just doing a lot of things here. Um, and I think it's a great card at the uncommon slot for your Golgari deck. Just a fantastic attacker and a fantastic way to uh, get some flyers out of the air uh, for Is It Boros uh, and maybe even a Celestia flyer. Uh, we also have Molder Hulk here, which is the last uncommon card for Golgari. A 9 mana 6-6. Six, six. You may think that's a lot, but with Undergrowth, this spell costs one colorless Celestia cast for each creature card in your graveyard. And when it enters the battlefield, you get to choose a target land from your graveyard and put it onto the battlefield, which is nice. Um, so, while it doesn't have Trample, which I wish it had Trample, um, it is still a great card for us because in the mid to late game, it can just be a 4 mana 6-6 six, six coming in just, you know, almost for free. Um, very powerful card, and it also gives you a land to help you ramp, so I really like it in the mid to late game. Kind of terrible in the early game, but again, this is what Undergrowth is all about. It's kind of going for that mid to late game where you have a lot of stuff in the graveyard and a lot of things pump other things, so... That's what Golgari is all about, though. And those are the five guilds. And of course, again, remember, you get to choose your guild whenever you walk into your local game store, hopefully. Um, if you can't, you know, try and uh, pick something you like a lot. Pick something you want to play. Like, I want to play Demir. I want to play Is It. Um, don't pick something because of a rare card or a lottery ticket card like Golgari for Assassin's Trophy. That might be the rare. That might not be. You never know. Um, so I really do like all of the uh, guilds here. I think they're very powerful in their own respects. I think for me, the most powerful as far as commons go is probably Selesnya, um, but I think Demir has a good handle on being able to have a lot of control going on with that surveil mechanic. Um, however, Golgari, if you have a lot of the pieces, same with Izzet, if you have a lot of the pieces for Undergrowth and Jumpstart, both of those decks can go off like crazy and be super powerful um, in the limited environment. But that's gonna do it for this video, guys. I hope you did like it, hope you learned something, hope you uh, you know like the video as well. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and make sure to uh, comment down below what your favorite guild is, what you're running, and uh, let me know, you know how you do. Also guys, like all of the previous pre-release videos for the past, I guess, two of them so far. I'm going to give away a box of Guild of Ravnica with the buy a box promo. I'll put that on the screen right now, right about here somewhere. Uh, so giving away a box with this video. So if you want to win that, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel and comment down below what your favorite guild is, what you ran at your local pre-release. And I will announce a winner uh, next uh, Tuesday. So when this video goes live, it'll be live for a full week and I'll announce it on Tuesday, which that date is the 2nd of October. <laughs> <laughs> I'll announce it sometime on the 2nd of October, probably through uh, trying to reach out to somebody. And if they get out to me and they say, hey, you know, I, I, I exist in the comments, I'll make sure that we have that connection and, you know, solidify that and then uh, announce it hopefully on Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. Uh, but thanks so much, guys, for liking the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I've already said that multiple times, but, you know, it's, it's like a YouTuber thing. You know, it's like a habit. I got to say it. <laughs> but I hope you have a great time at your pre-release and uh, report back. Let me know how you did. Love you guys, and I will see you in the next video.
Peace. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to smash that like button. Subscribe to the channel for more awesome NMTG content just like this. And make sure to tap the bell icon to be notified whenever a video is made live. If you want to keep watching content, here are two more videos for you. This video and many others are sponsored by MTGO Traders and Cape Fear Games. Buy and sell digital singles to build your online collection today with MTGO Traders, and get your paper singles, accessories, and much more from Cape Fear Games. Whatever your magic needs, both places have you covered.